Oh, hi, and welcome to Basic Folk, where we have honest conversations with folk musicians. It's Cindy Howes. I host the podcast. So nice to have you here. Before we get into our conversation with the one and only Grant Lee Phillips, I want to talk about ways that we can keep in touch, because don't you want to keep in touch? Best way is to sign up for our newsletter, which you can do at basicfolk.com. You can also follow us on social media at Basic Folk Pod on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram, although I am just getting closer and closer to deleting the whole thing. So newsletter is best. Social media is second best. If you're a fan of the podcast and you've been listening for a while and want to make a contribution financially to support us, you can do so at basicvoke.com slash donate. If you are a contributing member, thanks a lot. We are listener supported and everything that we're able to do here at Basic Folk made possible by members. And again, you can make a contribution basicfolk.com slash donate. If you give at least $5 a month or $60 for the entire year, you'll get access to Basic Folk's bonus episodes, which are located on our backstage page at basicfolk.com. Okay, former Grant Lee Buffalo frontman Grant Lee Phillips' latest solo album, All That You Can Dream, is quite dreamy. During the pandemic, Grant's been contemplating many things and figuring out how to spend his time away from the road. One interest he's been cultivating is painting. He's been sharing his paintings on social media and even used a painting of his beloved silver headphones, which you can also find in the liner notes for Grant Lee Buffalo's Mighty Joe Moon. He worked on this album from his home in Nashville, where he produced, engineered, mixed, and recorded himself. In addition to a few other musicians, he is joined by the crack team of bassist Jennifer Condos and drummer Jay Belleros, and it's always a treat to hear this dynamic duo. It sounds rich and raw at the same time, which feels very good in the chest. All That You Can Dream is filled with his signature songwriting using rich historical references to illuminate modern truths. Grant says, I'm always juxtaposing the events that we're all going through with similar events in history. In our conversation, we talk about Grant's early life in Stockton, California. He grew up knowing his family included Native American on both parents' sides. He actually made an album in 2012, Walking in the Green Corn, which explored his indigenous heritage. He gets into how David Bowie opened up his world, why he started playing guitar, and what he likes about playing 12-string versus a 6-string guitar. He talks about how acting has been a constant in his life, from being a professional magician at age 10 to appearing regularly as the town troubadour on Gilmore Girls. Hope you enjoy this interview with one of my favorite people. Let's take a listen to a song from Grant's new album. We'll hear A Sudden Place, and then we'll get to our conversation with Grant Lee Phillips on Basic Fog. Curl up my little feet Red cellophane Curl up my little fortune fish What will be my fate? Gold treasures in the ground Misfortune on the open sea On wake up in a hotel in some foreign country The world's a sudden place It turns on a dime And the night falls so suddenly Sometimes Such interesting time Grant, how's it going? Thank you so much for talking to me today. Yeah, good to, good to see you. Good to talk with you. Good to see you too. You grew up in Stockton, California. I was just out that way visiting the Bay Area. Oh, wow. And I did not know you're from Stockton. Yeah. Fun fact. You lived there until you were 19. Um, in 1983 or 1982, you left. 
Your parents were both of Native American descent. And in fact, you wrote an album in 2012, Walking in the Green Corn, exploring your indigenous heritage. So you had some knowledge of your ancestry as a kid, but how do you see your connection to your Native ancestors impacting your outlook on life? Oh, wow. That's a good question. That's uh, let, me, let me try to unpack all of that. I mean, my, my parents are actually... Um, of um, you know they have they have some mixed ancestry. I'm what's called an enrolled member of the uh, Muscogee Creek Nation, and um, that's you know that side of my uh, my family tree is the one that I kind of grew up knowing more about on my, my mom's side. And um, uh, you know I I grew up knowing that, and uh, she was she was from Oklahoma, you know. Mom's still around. <laughs> She's down the street, actually. Uh, oh, nice. <laughs> it is nice. But it was something that she she and my grandmother really instilled in me. I less I knew less about my dad's side, really. You know, um, just they didn't they didn't talk about too much. You know, I kind of just hung out and smoked cigarettes and <laughs> didn't say too much. <laughs> they were you know. Uh, but uh, anyhow, yeah, it was something that when I when I uh, when we had our daughter. Uh, I thought, you know, I'd like to, I'd like to kind of dig a little deeper, and um, make sure that I can kind of pass what I know on to her, you know. And uh, that's an ongoing pursuit, you know. There, a lot of this stuff, it wasn't written down, you know. Um, mm-hmm. It wasn't written down. Um, so there's a lot of excavation that one has to try to do, and there's only so far you can get. Sometimes, you know, you, before you hit a wall. Um, you know, there um, is what's called the Dawes Roll, which was created in the turn of the century. And that's a source for a lot of folks um, who are Muscogee, like myself, to kind of, you know, investigate <laughs> going back that far, mm-hmm. you know. But, of course, it goes back, you know, tens of thousands and beyond. You know, it just keeps going. And uh, But I am I am quite fascinated. And, and uh, to this day, I'm, I'm still learning more. I took some classes over the last number of months, um, trying to learn Muscogee as well, you know, and that's quite a the language that goes deep and broad. The language, yeah, because that that a language really tells you so much, you know. It connects you in ways that I think it's that are hard to pinpoint. Um, my great grandmother wasn't allowed to speak her language, you know, um, mm. yeah, and um, and so it was sort of lost, you know. A lot of those traditions mm. were lost in that way. What is it? How does it affect me and my outlook? You know, um, it's a difficult thing to quantify. But what I would, what I would say is that it was quite early on where I made that realization. You know, as a young person, that the history that we are taught um, doesn't necessarily always align with what we know to be true. Um, you know, if we, if our, if our families have endured. <laughs> and that goes for so many different groups of people, you know. And I, um, I think it's it's fair to say that, um, you know, that history is in greater danger more than ever of being being lost today. You know, being suppressed and and teachers are being threatened for teaching mm-hmm. history. You know, and how can you have a footing in the present? How can you move towards the future without this knowledge? You know. So yeah, I mean it does it does permeate my mind in ways that are hard to uh, to put a finger on, but that sort of makes you feel a bit like an outsider. It 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 pushes you to ask questions where perhaps if I if I didn't have that experience, if I didn't have that that connection, I I, I don't know that I would be a one to to always want to, you know, look under the hood and <laughs> ask the questions that uh that that seem so pertinent to me. Uh, on that note, your new album, All That You Can Dream, is filled with your signature songwriting. And I think from the press release, it says um, using rich historical references to illuminate modern truths. And you say, I'm always juxtaposing the events that we're going through with similar events in history. So can you talk about your interest in history, how um, that got started and how using it in your writing helps you understand current events? Well, uh, sure. It's pretty easy for a lot of us to see a parallel between this moment in time and those which perhaps our grandparents 
great grandparents may have lived through. Let's let's go back to the 30s in Europe. We ask ourselves, how how could such a thing occur? You know, such atrocities of that age. You know, there are books about it, lots of them, a lot of firsthand accounts. And yet we very, very often we've said to ourselves, well, that could never happen here in this country. Mm-hmm. You know, it, we're, we are unique in that way. I've always been suspicious of that type of thinking. Again, maybe it goes back to growing up as I did. You know? <laughs> uh, perhaps there are ways to kind of draw that connection for, for those that might be a little bit more um, reticent to want to see that, to want to draw mm-hmm. those conclusions. They aren't, they aren't happy conclusions. All right, let's talk about music now. (laughs) Yeah. Um, Your mom and dad were into their own styles of music. I read that your dad liked country music and your mom um, was like into the Carpenters um, and maybe had a little bit more of uh, pop music taste of the day. How did their music preferences impact your own? And also, what was it like when you started to develop your own sense of taste? Hmm. Uh, wow. I think the music that we get exposed to when we're quite young, it really, it sticks with you in, in a lot of ways that you don't even realize. I feel pretty fortunate that, you know, having, having, um, been born in 63, I was able to, you know, uh, devour a lot of the, a lot of that music. It, it still means a great deal to me. The, the music of the Beatles, for instance, you know, especially the Beatles, mm-hmm. but it was just a, an era where, melody and sort of societal awareness they could work hand in glove you know there could be a purpose even if that purpose was to to go inward and explore one's inner self (laughs) i mean there were there you know there there, some music is meant to escape other music is meant to help you get your arms around something that that feels a lot bigger than yourself but that period 60s 70s was was quite a renaissance, you know, and I think in a lot of ways that continued well into uh, the the 80s, you know. I mean, I, I, I did grow up with my parents' record collection around, but I, I ultimately, you know, when I was pretty young, 10, 11, I began to kind of seek out and discover my own my own music, you know, which was not at all like what my parents listened to you know they had <laughs> they had little interest in bowie or <laughs> or whatever i was into you know um uh, yeah my, my dad he, he wasn't too thrilled about buying me a uh hit parader magazine you know with queen on the cover i was like what is that you know <laughs> uh yeah. because he loved waylon jennings and you know and um charlie rich and all that kind of stuff you know charlie pride guy's name charlie and uh <laughs> um but i think my mom she loves singing she sings in in the choir uh you know to this day and she just you know she like my grandmother she's got a great voice and just you know it's she gets a lot of joy from singing having that around and everything that somebody's singing in the car to you all the time mm-hmm. <laughs> she still does it mm-hmm. so uh yeah, I think that I think that that uh, melodic ear is something that you can you can develop a bit, you know. Out of that question, I have two questions that are completely different. But um, I read that David Bowie, you mentioned Bowie, he opened a whole universe for you. So can you talk a little bit more about how your world changed when you discovered David Bowie's music? Maybe your musical world and the world beyond music for you. Yeah, sure. Goodness. Uh, I suppose I was probably introduced to Bowie through through AM radio. I would I would suspect I couldn't sleep very good. I still struggle with that, and so the only way I could fall asleep was to to keep the radio on all night long. And I would I would find that I would wake up and I would know the words to a thousand songs. I seem to have learned them <laughs> in my Moses. sleep. Yeah, <laughs> sleep learning, you know. Um, but uh, but Bowie was was definitely a favorite, and and I got a feeling it was probably low the album that kind of opened that up for me and um and I just I fell in love with it and uh one afternoon when I was when I was sick at home and my mother and father were at work um I happened to catch the Dinah Shore show and both Bowie and Iggy <laughs> were the guests it was crazy I, it was like a fever dream that one you know <laughs> would, would 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 write off as being you know a delusion or something. No, nah, no, nah, you were you were sick. You were. <laughs> right, <laughs> How right. bad was your fever? <laughs> uh, but it was amazing, and uh, and and I'm sure there's proof on YouTube as well. But that just like spun my head around, 
and um, and then I began to pry into you know the record bins and discover Ziggy Stardust and all of this other great music. And uh, in addition to that, as I got into my teens, my early teens, when I had picked up the guitar, um, I landed on a record called uh, Ball, which was like a BBC production, uh, the the Bertolt Brecht um, play with music uh, Ball, uh, and. I just I fell in love with that recording, and that kind of turned me on to Brecht and Kurt Weill. Um, then I began kind of looking at the liner notes. Who, who's playing on this record? Brian Eno and Robert Fripp, and I, I have to know about these people now. And what's this song? He, he didn't write this. This is a Velvet Underground song, you know, White Light, White Heat. Who's this hmm. Lou Reed, you know? <laughs> and before yeah, you know yeah. it, you're, and then who's, who's John Cale? And then you're off and running, and I love that. So he he was kind of That's like cool. the the door through which I just discovered so many of the things that made a real impact on me and everyone. Yeah. When you first like really came onto my radar, um, my friends and I were talking about this the other day. How we caught the two ten train to Boston to go see um, Velvet Goldmine. Oh wow! In the theaters, and we loved it. We were like seventeen, eighteen years old, and I bought that soundtrack, and it was like the most important soundtrack of my teens. How wild. And, why do you think yeah. that, why, what, what really struck a nerve? I think it was just like being different. Yeah. And yeah, just sort of like on the cusp of like knowing how different you are, but not really having the expression for it. So I found that in music quite a bit. Yeah. I was a huge like Tori Amos fan in high school. Uh, but that for sure was a huge soundtrack and it was cool it's cool to hear you talk about yeah David Bowie opening that world for you oh totally I think I think he, you know he was definitely that that personality for for Todd Haynes as well who you know made the movie and um, yeah. yeah I mean that that speaks to me yeah those those people out there that that make it okay to feel different <laughs> started playing guitar in your early teens so what was the synthesis for learning guitar like were there any musicians around you that inspired you oh goodness yeah you know when i was growing up there was a lot of there was a lot of music on television my my family we we never missed um a johnny cash special uh or <laughs> you know or or a weekend with hee-haw and uh, we all enjoyed, you know, guys like Roy Clark and, um, you know, just masterful guitarist. And I'm mesmerized by that. I wanted to learn how to do that. And uh, so when I was first picking up the guitar, it was like, you know, I was trying to trying to play Ghost Riders in the Sky and, you know, some fast licks. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then, I, Easy you know, stuff. it was Beginner a quick stuff. Oh, yeah. Right. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, you know, Rush and like... You know, how are they doing that? But you know what really kind of, <laughs> the light bulb for me was when I kind of discovered Neil Young and it was like, oh, I don't have to play fast. I can sit down on this <laughs> chair and I can play as <laughs> slow as I want to. <laughs> and it feels good and it sounds good and, you know, and, and you can, you know, or you can turn it up and still play slow. Um, so that, that kind of opened my world quite a bit. Hmm. I think this is true that you're known for the 12 string, the 12 string guitar, but where did your original interest from that instrument come from? Because you you play it at your solo shows, but you're also playing it in Grantley Buffalo. Um, and what do you like about that sound versus a six string guitar? Well, um, just, yeah, for in, in the interest of full d disclosure, I, I play the six string these days because the 12 string is really hard on your hands. It takes twice as long to change the strings and it cuts into lunch. And, <laughs> <laughs> and so I realized if I'm gonna have a sandwich then I'm gonna have to use less strings. And um, so that's kind of where I've been at for, for quite a while now. That said, it, it made a, uh, a, a reappearance on the new album, All That You Can Dream. I, I, I used quite a bit of 12 string on the new record and I had used it exclusively with Grantley Buffalo. And there were moments, I tell you, because the tension is so great on uh, on a 12-string guitar, an acoustic anyhow, uh, that my arm, I felt like somebody had hooked up a pair of jumper cables to my arm, and the muscles 
they stiffened and my arm just sprang off the neck of the guitar and I had no control of it. And I thought, oh man, I think I've really been kind of stressing my, uh, <laughs> these spine yeah. m- muscles and, you know, playing. Yeah. Cause I wouldn't just strum it. I would kind of bend the strings and kind of, it does a lot of crazy things that, especially when you run it through distortion pedals and, you know, a couple of Fender twins, it's not really meant for that. And, um, and so the result is kind of, is kind of wild, you know, like writing a, a bucking bronco playing that kind of and with that setup how did i fall in love with it i think it was glenn campbell i think it was gentle on my mind and maybe the cover of one of those glenn campbell albums where he's got this awesome corduroy uh sports coat with a western cut and uh he's got that 12 string guitar right there you know it's like the amazing 12 string of glenn campbell yeah. and thought, i gotta have that that coupled with um eight miles high the birds you know that sound it was like uh-huh. you know but that kind of there was a girl uh in high school she was more of a of a folk singer but she had a 12 string guitar and she let me borrow it for a bit and that was like oh i have to have one of these and i played it all through the starting in the 80s with the with shiva burlesque that was my my main guitar it makes it shimmer it makes a three-piece sound like you know a six-piece or something like that too yeah <laughs> that's cool i saw glenn campbell I think on his farewell tour, and I was floored by how good he was. Mm. Like at at that age, like his singing and his guitar playing, amazing. Yeah. Uh, oh yeah, and I forgot to um, go back to this. You were talking about your mother and your grandmother singing, mm-hmm. um, but I want to talk about you discovering your singing voice, and you've talked about realizing that feeling you get when you sing, like yeah. there's a joy that you just can't describe. Um, and of your singing, you've said it changes the molecules in my body. <laughs> um, and also your bio on all music says you have a soaring falsetto and a drawl that matches his aggressive acoustic guitar stomp and pouting physicality. Hmm. Interesting. Wow. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I like that. <laughs> yeah. When did you first discover that sensation singing gives you, and how have you felt about your voice over the years? Gosh, early, early on, I think, you know. Um, hmm. Early on, I, I, I mean, I really can't remember a time when I wasn't singing to myself. I, I, you know, I wanted to be in a band, wanted to put a band together when I, you know, was quite young. Always kind of struggled to, to, to do that, to find people to, to, you know, to play with. But any opportunity to sing really was, you know, I was totally, totally up for it. And yet I was very insecure about it. Um, hmm. Yeah, I mean, so much so that... <laughs> When I when I uh, I got together with a buddy of mine who has long since passed, he, he passed away when he was but a, a teenager, um, and we had a, we had a little band, and um, but he was the, he was our singer and I was the guitar player, and I was happy just to be there in the band, and I kind of carried that curiosity into uh, the first band that I was really involved in during the '80s for like seven years where I I didn't really kind of have that um strong urge to, to to sing and step forward you know eventually I, I think it kind of built up in me you know <laughs> without me really trying to I mean for one I was writing I was writing a lot of music but then it I just kind of I guess I had to uh to kind of fall into it I think I sang something for my wife and she was like you know I was like I, I kind of like singing you know and, she was, and finally one day I showed her something I'd I'd come up with and she says wow, you can actually sing. So I was like, you think? So <laughs> the, the fuse was sort of lit at that at that time and uh, it kind of grew from there. But it was like in the back of my head, as much as I, I emulated and I kind of adored all my favorite singers like, you know, Bowie and Johnny Cash. It's like all over the map, right? It's like um, mm-hmm. Elvis, um, on and on and on and on, you know. But in the back of my head, I always loved the sound of my grandmother's voice. And in some ways, I kind of like, found my voice by way of of hearing my grandma way off in the distance who I would back up I would go to her pl- her house and we'd spend afternoons and be playing on the guitar trying to trying to do my best lightning hopkins and she would sing gospel songs <laughs> but I would sort of I would sort of blues them up you know give them sort of a uh uh you know a, a blues swing and she liked that because 
she she liked jazz and blues and Mahalia Jackson and all of that kind of stuff. That's cool. Yeah. <laughs> we were just I was just mentioning Tori most a moment ago and for some reason when you were talking about your grandmother, it reminded me that she is also of native descent. Oh, I know, I know. I remember that. I remember hearing that. I can't remember. I just tried to look up Tori Amos Native, and like her latest album is called Native Invader, so I'm not going to find it very quickly. But <laughs> she's talked a lot about her her grandfather in in that similar. Yeah, she grew up in the Pentecostal church thing. as well, if I'm if I'm correct. A lot of a lot of church mm-hmm. church church influences, and uh, my mm-hmm. you know my parents didn't really bring me off to church, but they sent me off with my grandparents on both sides. Did your grandparents go to the same church? Uh, my grandparents on my mom's side went to a few different little country churches, and um, I don't think they ever went to the same church that my dad's parents went to, though, hmm. for some reason. I don't know, but uh, just, you know, different different scenes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know did how you they... Have a favorite? Did I have a favorite? Uh, I think my favorite was to stay home because it was too scary, you know? It was a little scary, oh. to tell you the truth, um, especially for a kid, you know? If you've ever seen an old man in a full polyester, drenched in sweat, with an overdriven PA system <laughs> and an Epiphone guitar, screaming at at the top of his lungs, that always Epiphone. Yeah, these these neighbors of mine, uh, their dad was a pastor, and they played Epiphone guitars, and they had Vox amplifiers, and they would be like the church band. They were the first kids that I learned to jam with. So I would go to their place and I would go, what happens if we turn this up, you know, to 11? And it would, it would sound great. It's fantastic. But, the, the, you know, the, their parents weren't too excited about it because sure. I was leading the entire family down, you know, the, the path of a fire. And, um, mm. yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, well. <laughs> Acting has been a constant in your life. You were a professional magician at age 10. Mm-hmm. Is that a true fact? That's yeah. that's a true fact, yeah. True fact. You also worked and performed at a theater in Stockton as a teenager. You've done stage comedy, appeared in film and TV, most notably on Gilmore Girls as the town troubadour. The last time you and I talked was at WIP, yeah. and... I went up into the newsroom where all of the women up there were in their like 20s. And I was like, guys, the town troubadour from Gilmore Girls is here. (laughs) You should all come down. And they all did. And I remember there was like a gang of them after Uh. they were all talking to you. That was fun. That's great. Anyways, what did you first like about performance in an acting medium and how did you find it helpful for your musical stage appearances? Um, wow. Um, I guess, you know, it was, it was doing magic when I went, when I was a kid, that was my, that was my foray into performing, you know, and whatever comfort level that I have, it all goes back to that. I would play, the uh, the local amusement park, the Toadstool Theater, it was called. It was just this fantastic, surreal theater that that, <laughs> as you can imagine, looked as though it were it, it was built uh, out of out of toadstools, an Alice in Wonderland kind of theme. Someone was on mushrooms. Someone was on mushrooms, and there I was uh, in the middle of it all, <laughs> performing my magic to 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 groups of children and and families on a Saturday, and uh, from there began to book myself in private parties and um, put the business card you know out there and began trying to work it when I was pretty young in that way and uh, I don't know where that comes from it's it's something that I, I think in some ways it I, I may have I don't know that I can access that 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 person anymore <laughs> I don't find myself leaving my business business cards around uh, these days or or performing magic but uh, but yeah that was a thing and then I, and then I got a job uh, at a dinner theater it was basically kind of like a vaudeville revival melodrama kind of house it was fun i i I worked there was that in stockton in stockton and stockton was fantastic in this way there was a lot of old weirdness there yeah this this dinner theater that had been going since like the 60s i think it was a mainstay there in stockton 
And I worked there every weekend throughout uh, my high school years. They had an adjacent ghost town where I could be a stuntman, self-taught stuntman throwing myself off buildings into wagons of hay. Ooh. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> what a great, I mean, what a great way to, uh, you know, for a kid to, to spend the, their, their teenage years and uh, some theater. So all of that kind of stuff, you know, was an opportunity to try my hand at, at several things. And then it kind of came in handy when, when I got the call to do Gilmore Girls, you know, because I had that experience doing some plays and being on stage and doing things other than, than you know, playing music. I mean, there's a bit of, a bit of, uh, you know, a bit of acting, I suppose, when you are uh, a songwriter and, or even if you're just a singer, because you sort of have to embody that, that song, that piece of work and access the mm -hmm. feelings that, uh, that drew you to that song or that the feelings that inspired the writing of it, you know, you kind of have to revisit that place and be present in the very moment as well. So it's, it's, it's a fascinating kind of, um, you know, um, kind of thing. I think it must be very similar. It seems very similar to me uh, as to what we have to do when we're, when we're acting, although acting is also, you know, it's physical. And I found that out on Gilmore Girls. Like, can you play a little bit faster, but, but definitely walk a little slower though. When, when you do, it's like, Oh man, this is a hard job. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. Yeah. Oh my gosh. So here's just a compact synopsis of the 80s for you. You moved to L.A. in the early 80s yeah. to attend film school at UCLA. Oh, actually, correction. Sorry. I got to correct you. Sorry. Fact, fact checkers. <laughs> I went to Columbia, which is a little, at that time, it was, it was a small like trade school next to Pink's Hot Dogs on La Brea. It was a night school. I, I, would roof, I would roof houses during the day, and I would drive into Hollywood at night, and um, I would take classes with, I would take the regular classes, you know, your, your history and all that stuff, but then we would talk about um, television production and how, how, a, how a news program works. You know, camera three, cue camera three. <laughs> <laughs> um, that, that was it, and I kind of realized, eh, I want to make weird movies. I, I, I want to make... You know, movies like Eraserhead. I don't think I want to direct commercials for car lots. And um, mm. so that's that's what, you know, the UCLA thing. You might be thinking of, of Jim Morrison. We, we get we get a lot of yeah. confusion about that <laughs> to this day. <laughs> it could be Wikipedia or some other source of, of evil. Well, I'm going <laughs> to write a strongly worded letter. Do it! To wherever I read that. <laughs> but all the while... You were performing in bands yeah. and soaking in the L.A. music scene. And then is this right? In the late 80s, you lived on campus at Cal Arts. That's, a, that's, kind, of a, that's kind of a secret because I, I, uh, I don't know if they'll, if, they'll, uh, if they'll come after me. You know, Yeah, I, I like a lot of people. <laughs> um, we kind what of was, like. What's that phrase people use where they're like, I inventoried classes or I audited classes yes, at I was, Cal Arts? I, I did a little auditing. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> um yeah they first my my when i met my wife she moved in with me but apparently uh, somebody forgot to pay the rent and when the landlord realized that then we were out of there and spent some spent some um some time auditing um the floor of her studio with our cat uh and a piece of foam for a while and that was uh that was an interesting time but but you know very exciting and they would you know they had a lot of great visiting artists barbara kruger and would you know would come to town and you know john mm. baldessari was a teacher there and it was a really kind of kind of a great thing and for me i mean the way that i kind of discovered it one it was in the very town that i was living and working in in uh, valencia i lived in newhall adjacent but our uh one of the musicians in the band that i was in began taking class he began in the music school there and they have a great music course you know they're known for their world music that you know sitar players mm. and like you know i mean people who play instruments that you know you can't even imagine and and theater and of course animation is the big one that time in la in the 80s must have been you know you said it's like very exciting but also the word that comes to mind is really formative so how do you see that era impacting who you would become in terms of musical influence, intellectual influence, 
and maybe even like work ethic earned from your roofing day job. <laughs> yeah, well, it, it gave me something to, um, to to work against. You know, it's definitely an antagonist for an artist to uh, to walk out on a ledge or uh, walk out on a roof and look down and realize I don't think I like being here. I think I'd rather be with my guitar, you know, on a stage than slopping hot tar on the roof um, in the in the heat of Los Angeles <laughs> summer. I said that to myself. Nine years later, I got off the roof. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it took a while. But yeah, you know, I mean, that was that was a wild time in Los Angeles. I've thought about it quite a bit lately. Some of the people that I encountered in that period, um, uh, Bruce Leitcher and his band Savage Republic, you know, they were um, they were kind of like um, a, a very indie band before it was even you know a term in, in in downtown Los Angeles. And they would hold these big events where you know that were very primal and noise driven, and um, it was just a, a particular time where where art and music and performance were all coalescing. It kind of blossomed into what would become Lollapalooza and Coachella and a lot of other scenes that would splinter from that. Mm, a lot of those very cool. those very bands you they have their roots in this period of time. You know, P- Perry Farrell, for instance. You know, and Jane's Addiction, mm-hmm. and and on and on and on. So I, I it was a, it was a great time in that way. And I was, you know, I did a, a couple of weeks uh, uh, in a production of Cowboy Mouth, the Patti Smith Sam Shepard play. Um, which they wrote together and um, playing the lobster man downtown. <laughs> <laughs> I would get involved in things like that, you know, or, or you know, in scoring a, a student film or any any number of things. I think it really had it had a big impact on me and my bandmate and Shiva Burlesque, Jeff Clark, huge, huge, huge influence on the things that I'm still quite curious about the writers that I'm fascinated with and a lot of that music that I was was talking about earlier, you know. It was his record collection, his milk crate full of John Cale and um hmm. whatever else and everything that uh that we shared when we were roommates. Your band Grantley Buffalo operated from nineteen ninety one to nineteen ninety nine. How's that fact checker? Uh, that, that sounds about correct. right. Although, you know, I mean, yeah. one could, you, you have to realize that um, even as early as, say, 87, that's about when, that's about when Joey and I began to play together because he was the drummer in Shiva Burlesque. Mm-hmm. And then mm-hmm. by 90, 89, that's about when Paul came in. So we had that, we had that late 80s kind of history as well. Um, and by the time Grantley Buffalo made Fuzzy, Joey and I had already ha- had recorded two records together with Shiva Burlesque. So I think that that rapport, it, it it meant it meant for something, you know, the the hours mm-hmm. we'd clock together. Definitely, one of the reasons that you walked away from Grantley Buffalo, and this, I feel like I'm making some assumption to, assumptions here that you can correct me on if I'm wrong, but. Um, one of the reasons you walked away from the band, uh, which was on a major label at the time, was due to the shift in the music industry. I was a teenager in the 90s, and I think of the early 90s, when I think of that time period, Grantley Buffalo is one of the bands that I think fondly of in terms of radio. Like you found pretty good success on the indie alternative stations. And I, as a radio person, love to talk about the Telecommunications Act of 1996. Which yeah. It's like, that would be the subtitle of my podcast, Basic Folk, you know, Conversations with Folk Musicians, and we talk about the Telecom Act of 1996. Anyways, um, that act allowed companies to hold monopolies on media outlets like radio, which like basically washed out most of the indie music, most of the women, most of the minorities on the radio. So as someone who I see was like directly impacted by that shift, I don't know if you agree or not, how do you reflect on the industry before and then after that act of, in 1996? Oh, I think there's, there's incredible truth to that. I don't know that I even realized it at the time. It's not a real sexy headline. 
<laughs> the Telecommunications Act. <laughs> hmm, let me right. <clears throat> tell me more. Uh, That's a conversation killer for sure. Yeah. <laughs> Unless you're like super nerdy about it. Yeah, but you know what? Now that when it's I like it, changed the media landscape incredibly. Yeah, my my ears prick up pretty quickly when I when I uh, when I hear that term today because it was a really pivotal moment. It was the beginning of that monopolization of radio. That and and even the venues themselves were becoming part of that same conglomerate. Yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. less of those real mavericks that could go out on a limb. I mean, there weren't less of them. It's just they too were were diminished in terms of their spread, their influence. You know, mm-hmm. the the ability to, to share what they had discovered. You know, and that's such a big part of this. You know, I don't know how we get that back. I mean, you know. I don't know that the the internet has necessarily you know, repaired that. <laughs> I don't think so. Yeah, I, I I don't know. I mean, the 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 reasons that I would go off on my own, there's a multitude of reasons. I think I think it you know, firstly personal, but that's part of it. Also realizing that the only way to stay afloat in the manner that uh, we had would be to to accept the terms. The, the of of being on a label like Warner's, you know, which I think it had become quite top heavy at, at that that point where we would be expected to go out and 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 do these major tours and do a lot of support, you know, and all of that kind of stuff to quote unquote break the record, you know, and promote the record. But that also made us put us in a position where we we were really heavily reliant on tour support. And that kind of stuff was becoming, you know, harder to come by as well, you know. I mean, it's a miracle, I think. It's, it's a wonderful miracle that bands like Wilco were able to survive that period, you know. But a lot of us were kind of like went down that certain path. I think it, it, was, it was pretty hard. How does a band do that? If, you're, if you're, you're, you, you're given that opportunity to go and support a well-known, legendary act, you know, but how are you going to pay for that and everything? You know, it's as an opening band, you you kind of have to go to the record company with hat in hand. Help us get to <laughs> wherever we, we need to go, you know. And eventually it was like, oh, that's not going to happen. So I think for us, in some ways, we, we probably might have been better off if we had slowly sort of laid m- more, more groundwork headlining in smaller clubs. But I don't know. It happens how it happens. And for us, it was quite quite a rapid um, ascent in terms of Europe especially and that's also where we I think we put in more time in terms of being a headliner mm-hmm. but things changed I mean by the time we got to the end of the 90s I think I think you could you could sense that the uh, the, the playlist themselves you know they were quite they were quite different you know you can't imagine it just became such, such a different thing yeah <laughs> definitely yeah uh, it was a beautiful thing, though, for that for that split second when when you could turn yeah. turn on the radio and and hear the something like the Breeders or Dinosaur Junior or you know a lot of these yeah. these just beautiful freaks <laughs> that would cre- yeah, yeah. creating like art you know and uh, that that was an exciting time and I think it kind of lifts everyone up it kind of challenges everyone okay come on show us your weirdest come on you know and I think I think REM were a great great one in that way they they made some some incredible records where, you know, it was really just for the love of it. And that, that kind of, that spurred a lot of us on. It's like, yeah, that's what I want to do. That's why we got into this because we, you know, we like discovering weird and making weird music. You did a weekly live streaming during the pandemic. Every Sunday you hosted live from the parlor, or if you're from New England, the Pala. The Pala. Um, how did all those live streams impact or change your performance in concert? Well, it, it, it gave me some something to focus on. I can psych myself out pretty easily if I'm away from performing. You know, mm-hmm. I think it's probably a little bit, I'm going to go out on a limb and I'm going to say it's a, maybe it's a little bit like being an, an ice skater. These people, you, you know, we know that they can skate. They, they have to be able to skate to be out there. And yet, you know, you, you see it. You know, here comes, uh, here they come. And they're wiped out, you know, doing something that they've probably done a thousand times that week. And so you can, you can psych yourself out. So it gave me a chance to 
to just do it, do my thing, feel connected to everyone, play new songs that I was I was working on. You know, if I had just written a song like one of these new ones, then I could play it that weekend. It made life as a musician a lot more tangible. The new album, All That You Can Dream, um, these songs, for the most part, were written during and in response to the pandemic and current events during the pandemic. And you said about the album and the pandemic, when you're a musician used to certain cre- a certain creative groove, it's disorienting to have this rhythm disrupted. So previously, how aware of your rhythm were you um, at the time the pandemic started and how did its disruption make you come to appreciate your former groove? Well, I think I think this is, is this probably ties into what I was just just saying, which is I'm kind of tr- making these connections as I as I uh, as I dig into your questions. Um, I think it's probably it's it's easy for me to talk myself out of going on the road. Mm-hmm. I <laughs> like working out. Uh, like, oh, I don't. Yeah, I guess so. You know, I mean, it, <laughs> once I'm once I'm up on stage. And I'm playing. I was like, I love this. I love this. But if I'm not on stage and I haven't been on stage for like, you know, a month, maybe less. Sometimes I'll, I'll, I'll oh, man, what am I going to play? I don't have any songs. I've got like 15 albums, you know, but uh, but yet the thought will will um, the, the thought will be there. You know, I don't have I don't know what I'm going to play. I, they've heard all my songs. I have my new ones. I don't know if I know my new ones that well, though. I know my old ones, but they're kind of old. The ones I really know are really old. Maybe people are more tired of these songs than they realize. <laughs> so they just go through this crazy, crazy contortion, you know, uh, and uh, it's like, mm, maybe I should not play. I should just, I should just, um, I don't know, just maybe write some new songs, take it, you know, like take a step back. And um, when I do so, one, I forget how much I love playing. And I forget that it's when I'm out traveling and I'm bored and I'm stimulated by all of this new stuff. That's when I have a moment to sit down at the edge of the bed. I've just tuned my guitar, put on the new strings. I was like, hmm, I kind of like that. What is that chord? I don't know. I like that. I'm going to sing that into my phone. Yeah, I try to remember that. And I'll work on that. And then I come home with all of these little fragments, you know. Little little seeds of, of songs, mm. melodies, chords, mm-hmm. you know, a, a verse or two that I've, uh, maybe it's a title that I've written um, into um, my uh, my notepad. So all of that stuff is really helpful in terms of, that's, that's the rhythm, I think. I usually have some time off in the winter. I try to avoid touring too heavily in the winter, but I, I do now and then. But That's a good call. Yeah, although I mean, I have I have wound up in you know the Arctic Circle during during the winter. Uh, Whoops, <laughs> uh, it's been done, um, but that's usually kind of like a time when I kind of turn inward and I begin to do some writing as well. Mm-hmm. I think most of these songs kind of began um, um, back in like mm, probably January. I mean, in some ways, they're kind of st- time stamped because um, mm-hmm. when you listen 2021. to twenty twenty one. Yeah, rats in a barrel. Uh, Peace is a delicate thing. They're, those were all written directly after the January sixth. Um, what do you call it? Insurrection. Insurrection. That's a good word. Attack. <laughs> yeah, hoo ha. Uh, I mean, <laughs> uh, hoot nanny. Hoot nanny. Yeah. I've, my God. So uh, you know, that's where that's where some of the songs began. Those are some of the first songs, and. Um, you know, cruel trick is, uh, and it, you know, that's that's me trying to make sense of the time at home, mm. driving around the country with the windows down, you know, looking at barns and cows and silos and um, finding some bit of peace in all of it. So it's all there, you know. Mm. It's sort of sort of time stamped in that fashion. You're talking a little bit about recording yourself on your phone in voice memos when you have an idea. This might be a weird question, but I thought it would be fun for you. Um, I'd like to know more about your relationship with technology when it comes to songwriting (laughs) in terms of like your process, but also like how you've written about it. So first, let's talk about the process. 
Um, I found this quote from you that said, years ago when I would get an idea at an inopportune time, I would call my home phone and sing it into an answering machine. So when I would get home, I would have song ideas, which is great. And there's like something dreamy to me about like that process. Like I've recently been trying to embrace old technology to like varying degrees of success. So I'm interested in what you think, like what do you like or not like about the immediacy of being able to like capture yourself on your voice memos on your phone? Oh gosh. Um, yeah, that's, that's true. Uh, you know, I mean the answer machine was, that was the, the state of the art at that time though. It, it was an old <laughs> technology. <laughs> I used to put a lot of work into my outgoing messages back in the day, you know, like full production. I had a little four track machine and I could do music and a voiceover and, you know, <laughs> high level of production for the answer machine message. Um, man. Uh, but you know, yeah, it was, it was a thing. I, I, I didn't want to forget the idea. So that was before I had a, uh, I don't remember how I would have been calling home in that, in that case. Must have been a flip phone, phone or something right? like that. It was probably a pay phone. Wow. Yeah, you know, I don't know. A lot of us had had those little cassette recorders when we were growing up. I still have one. I went out and got one. Because I just love how it sounds so warble, warbly, mm -hmm. if that's a word. And um, yeah, there's something very, very mysterious about that. Dictaphones, all that kind of stuff. That It allows you to hear the melody and the idea of the song, but it's not real true in terms of its audio fidelity so you can kind of enjoy it as though it's someone else singing you know you can get a little bit objective and, and less kind of critical which is always a good thing when you're when you're creating yeah. um that's why lennon kind of um he, he liked hearing himself with the slapback apparently couldn't stand the sound of his own voice but if you could make him sound like elvis or you know gene vincent or something then it's like yeah okay that works for me <laughs> then i can accept myself you know it's like it's like a filter on your on your iPhone, I guess. Um, mm -hmm. So uh, you know, it, it, I use my home my home rig in such a way that's that's pretty simple. A good microphone or two, and I I like the immediacy of it that I can just sit here like I'm doing and play the guitar and sing. And the barometer I go by is like you know the gauge I go by is like did it feel like a good performance? You know, am I warmed up? Am I, you know, am I just kind of like, am I, am I uh, expressing the song and how I feel about it today? And if I'm not, you know, if I'm not up to snuff today, maybe I got a head cold. Maybe I don't have enough of a head cold today. But then I can <laughs> do it tomorrow. You know, that's the beauty of being at home and, and doing it that way when the, yeah. when, when the timing feels just right. Um, that helps a lot. With, with some of these songs, I did a little more experimentation on the ground floor um, using a you know, combination of, you know, by, by, by layering piano parts and guitar parts and then gradually, you know, following the sound of that, of that um, arrangement to discover the lyrics. And other ones were much more simple, like just sitting down with the guitar and, you know, and writing out the thoughts that were in my head. It's a chain reaction, you know, it's like uh, a chordal progression uh, that I land upon. There usually has to be something that kind of strikes me as being fresh about it. Um, that will inspire a melody and that will somehow coax the words out of me. The words are, you know, always slightly uh, precluded by the music. Um, but that said, I feel like there's an argu argument to be made that the intent was always there and in some ways, part of the lyric was always there. It's what drove you to those chords. It's what drove you to seek mm -hmm. out those those colors. If you were in a melancholic kind of mood, then you probably wouldn't play a skiffle <laughs> number. You would <laughs> you would play something that that expressed in a physical way what you were experiencing internally. So it's all kind of one chain reaction, and it's really hard to say what comes mm -hmm. first, you know. And then in terms about writing about technology in your songs before, like a really good example of a Grantley Buffalo song is Stars and Stripes, yeah. which was written at a time when like a handheld video camera, when those 
first came out, and then that started to reshape journalism and people's awareness. And of course, with the iPhone, things have like changed exponentially. How has being able to process the changes technology brings to our lives helped you to adjust and observe how tech impacts humanity? Well, I mean, we are, our, our lives, our minds are certainly fused with technology. I, I don't know that I could, could have really grasped the significance of such a thing that, that early on. Um, I mean, Stars and Stripes was written about 1991, maybe something like that, you know? Um, it's, it's somewhat prescient, I think, uh, you know, probably born out of, out of some inherent, uh, anxiety, (laughs) um, you know, also my interest in filmmaking and, and capturing things, um, capturing life uh, in some recorded medium, you know, um, but now, I mean, it's, it's been the thing that has, has, um, given way to surveillance, whether we like it or not. And it's also been the tool that has been pivotal in our justice system, you know? So it's, 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 it's quite, you can't really overstate the significance of that small tool that we possess in our hands, you know, that we Mm -hmm. possess in our pockets. Um, I listened to Stars and Stripes a little earlier today. Me too. Oh, wow. It's a good song. Thank you. You know, I mean, it, it, it touches on so many things. It, 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 it uh, anxiously uh, delves into a state of unwanted surveillance, nationalism. That point, uh, the, the idea that, that what happened in Germany in World War II could happen anywhere. Uh, mm. You know, to, to be on alert for these things. Don't think they couldn't happen here, you know, the disease of, of nationalism. Did you know? I mean, there's a, there's a line in the song that even that even um, sunflower speaks of a one of a one. I think, oh goodness, how fascinating! Everything there, the uh, uh, the image of the sunflower even appears. So it's, it feels quite quite of the moment, really, <laughs> for all of those reasons. You know, it was the image that I was drawn to in that moment. I mean, I'm thinking back a few decades now. It may have been the sound of the word at the time, you know, but the idea uh, it's it's the image of something natural that speaks of the spring and abundance uh, juxtaposed against a backdrop of decaying infrastructure, still mill mm-hmm. streets overrun, the ghost of cars in the yard. You know, a lot of, a lot of that imagery was uh, directly talking about this gutting of the country, you know, in, mm-hmm you know, in the Rust Belt and, and these, these places that had been, you know, hallmarks of progress at one time, yeah. you know, how these things that we have created that, uh, that are such institutions and hallmarks that, that spews soot into the air are grinding down. And, and now let's have it, let's put up the next slide, a sunflower, sunflower speaks of a one, the oneness, also the symbol mm-hmm. of Ukraine. <laughs> Right, mm. and that has reminded reminded us of our oneness. That you know, we are all people, and we're all vulnerable, and mm-hmm. um, we have to think about that a, gr- a great deal these days. Not to get too preachy, but that's that's on my mind a lot. Yeah. During the pandemic, you did uh, a bunch of painting. Um, in fact, you painted all that you can dreams cover, which depicts a 30-year-old pair of headphones. <laughs> Those headphones appeared in the uh, liner notes for Mighty Joe Moon. And of this record you were talking about, it's the kind of, of the new record, it's the kind of record where when we were growing up, we probably would have enjoyed listening to it on headphones going within ourselves. As a musician, as a music fan, headphones must play a huge role in your life. They do for me. You know, I'm, I always say like I have like seven pairs of headphones within arm's reach wherever I go. What has been your relationship to headphones over the years? <laughs> oh, goodness. Uh, <laughs> well, um, yeah, I have, I have worn them quite a bit. 
Um, the uh, yeah, the, the the cans you're speaking of, I, I I spray painted those things silver. I thought I thought they looked better silver. I spray painted them, and um, you can you can check them out. They're there in the the Mighty Joe Moon uh, package. And Are I they kept... silver in the Mighty Mighty Joe Moon? Yeah, credits? I think the the, fo- the yeah. photograph is black and white, but you can see that the headphones are silver. And I just kept them around a little a little memento of that period. And um, I wasn't I wasn't really um, looking to paint an album cover, but as you said, I I was spending my time doing a lot of painting over the last couple of years and it just made for a still life you know i liked it sometime later when i began to ponder what what is there an image that i've created because i know i've noted that a lot of times the things that i'm preoccupied with visually there is often some kind of intersection between what i'm what i'm interested in writing about or singing about that one kind of leapt out my wife she pointed to that says how about this i think this is very mysterious and very strong. I think you should think about that. So I'm like, mm, okay. So credit to my wife, uh, firstly. But I, I have come to realize that it, it is, it is <laughs> such a fitting image uh, for this time. And it's it's as though we all have kind of put on our headphones and gone inward. You know, it's it's we've been mm-hmm. been forced into that situation. Even if you know, even just kind of going inward and being within our home and under our own roofs and. You know, we've been bombarded with uh, so much in the last couple of years. The pandemic, the, you know, the upheaval that we've, you know, we've been feeling, you know, nationally, domestically. Um, uh, For me, music is a big part of how I cope with these stresses. And that's a very internal thing, you know. Um, I get more out of music in that way, and I think I always did as a kid. You know, I, I, uh, I've enjoyed going to shows over the years. I've enjoyed playing shows, but um, the stuff that really moves me is that's a real personal, um, you know, internal and yet physical experience. You know, and um, I don't know. I mean, I think I think I'll I at some point maybe I'll I'll make a record that will shake the rafters and <laughs> uh, <laughs> that's possible but um but yeah i mean i don't know i i i'm drawn to to stuff uh, I, don't, I wouldn't say that it's cerebral necessarily it's but it's it's meant to kind of seep into um the recesses of our unconscious hmm. all right before we go will you do the lightning round i'll try but i don't know what that is but i've already agreed to it all right. Yes. <laughs> no backing out now. Okay. Okay. Here we go. What is the first song you learned on the guitar? Mmm. Wow. I think it was Dueling Banjos. Ha! <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. Okay. But only one. But only one of the banjos. Only one of. The- <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I would play it, and then I'd have to wait, and I play, and then I wait. Uh, wait. It's yeah. very, very frustrating. Tragic. Um, what is your karaoke song? Uh, you know what? I think I, I hate karaoke. It makes me. It makes it. It gives me an ulcer. The idea of it. I do this. I do this because it's my. It's. It's very important to me. And uh, oh god, I. I. I've only. I have to remember because I, I. I did one one time. What was the song? Uh, you know. Um, oh, it, it, positively. Positively Fourth Street. I did oh, as a karaoke okay. song one time, and Good it was it was song. it was miserable. Did it kill? <laughs> <laughs> Just about killed me. And uh, <laughs> no, 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 karaoke's supposed to be fun. That, I, that's not why I, I come to music. So. <laughs> <laughs> uh, who was your first celebrity crush? Oh goodness, I think it was the powerful Mach Five. The car in Speed Racer, yeah, yeah the car was just <laughs> fantastic. Yeah. What was the first album you bought with your own money? Oh, wow. Um, gosh, that might have been Elton John's Greatest Hits, I think. Yeah. Nice. Good one. Yeah. yeah. What was your first concert? I knew Young at the Cow Palace in uh, very, uh, my teens, yeah. His trans, oh. trans tour. Uh, and, um, oh, wow. Yeah. He, you know, he played 
all by himself and acoustically yeah. and then with his electronic setup you know but oh yeah that was that was a big one he doesn't have an album called tron does he mm, i don't think so he has an album called trans was that a friend of mine told me that he wrote that for his son i've heard that yeah i think he was he was also really kind of really um influenced by devo i think at the time mm -hmm. as well i think he did some work with, with them really wild record yeah, computer age. It, you, I mean, you know, it was wild to see it. I had I had no idea what I was in for, and I don't think any of his oh, wow. his old diehard fans were yeah, ready for yeah. it either. <laughs> yeah. What was the last book you read? The last book I read. Um, gosh, did I finish it? If I did, um, it's called Mad Enchantment by Ross King. Claude Monet and the paintings of the water lilies. Ooh. Yeah. So it's a good, it's a big old thick book and it um, just goes into great, great uh, detail. Um, uh, just, you know, just beautifully written book um, about the uh, the lives of Claude Monet and Edouard Manet and, and the, uh, the other impressionist and that period of time and what it was like to be an artist, you know. And, you know, doing some of his most incredible well-known mm. work uh you know in the, in the midst of a war it's just raining bombs around him and just wow. something else you know there was a, a plague that broke out in the midst of all this as well um wow. <laughs> yeah yeah sounds familiar sounds doesn't good. it yeah yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> flying or invisibility invisibility i i fly all the time it's not what is, it's, it's not that fun. No, and they charge you for Wi-Fi. If you were invisible, you could just, you know, I'm sure you could just get on somebody's network pretty easily. You could get on their hotspot, you know, they would That's never know. That's how it works. Yeah. Okay, this is the last question. Where is the most beautiful place you've ever visited? Oh, where I live here in Tennessee is, is definitely way up there, I think. Wow. Um, yeah, that's a nice thing to be able to go out your door and, be amongst mm -hmm. the trees and um, it kind of drove me to paint to want to paint landscapes some years ago my wife and I had an opportunity to go to uh, to Australia and spend um, several days in the rainforest and that was something else you know just like yeah you know these these exotic birds squawking all through the night uh, <laughs> uh, that that was really something else you know yeah fresh mangoes I don't know, if, uh, but yeah. So that that would that would be a, New New Zealand is a nice place. Come to think of it, yeah, that's pretty nice. I don't know. I love the. I like I like all sorts of places. The Southwest. See, hmm. I don't know. It's hard. Gosh, this is the this is the one the one that really stumps me. Well, we'll accept four answers. Okay, four answers. Yeah, I'm. I mean, I'm. I'm a little. I'm a little bit blessed an embarrassment of riches there when it comes to seeing <laughs> beautiful places but you know what i think part of that comes comes down to uh finding beauty in in all sorts of forms i used to take the mm -hmm. train between los angeles and stockton and i took my camera my little camera with me and every time i would see some some broke down factory or some warehouse i would go to the window and i would take a shot take a picture i, th I thought that stuff was incredible and a person on the train, a couple, an older couple, became very agitated and, and she said to her husband, why does he have to take a picture out of, of everything that's ugly? <laughs> and I thought, wow. I said, I don't think it's ugly. I think it's beautiful. When you have those kinds of standards, <laughs> then you find beauty all, in all sorts of places, you know? Yeah. Yeah, it's called patina, my friend. <laughs> that's what I should have said to her. <laughs> and, and then I should have snapped her picture. Yeah, totally. <laughs> yeah, the one regret in life. Yeah. That's funny. Right. Uh, well, thank you so much, Grant. I got to tell you, uh, you have always been one of my favorite people to interview. I think we've done it three times now, at least, and always a home run. Oh, thank, well, thank you, you so much for always, you know, you've always been super cool to me. Oh. Uh, so I really appreciate this longer conversation. It's really I've really enjoyed yeah catching up with you and been you know given this opportunity to to, to jar my memory here on all this stuff. <laughs> it's fun. 
Thank you so much. This episode of Basic Folk was produced by me, Cindy Howes. Alex Stanton composes our music. You can find Basic Folk on the Bluegrass Situation Podcast Network. You can look for us on the SiriusXM app by searching for Basic Folk. You can also find us wherever you get your podcasts or at our website, basicfolk.com. Thanks a lot for checking it out. Okay, we'll talk to you next time. Bye.